Well, we appreciate you coming over here, joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. I've been super excited to to connect with you. You know, we we had a couple conversations before. We got a, mm -hmm. a great little entrepreneurial uh, friend group of ours. Um, but tell us a little bit about you, right? Like you grew up here in Portland. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about what that was like growing up here for you. Um, my experience growing up here was uh, I loved growing up here, honestly. I'm the oldest of five. Oh, wow. Um, and my parents did a really good job of taking care of us. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that's not an experience that everybody has. And I'm super aware of that. Um, a house of five also, uh, you know, takes a lot of money, but they did it. They did it really, really well. You <laughs> know, a, I don't, that's a lot of mouths to feed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of mouths to feed, but I also think I was super aware of that growing yeah. up too. Like, you know, I always wanted my siblings to make sure that they had, you know, the, the opportunities, the, the toys, you know, things like that. Um, but I had a lot of opportunity to do extracurriculars. Like I was, I went to an elementary school that was super into the arts and different extracurricular activities. So I joined those things. Yeah. Um, middle school, I went to a arts middle school called Da Vinci and it was very artsy. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that experience was interesting too. And then to, you know, take a turn, I went to a private Catholic high school. Um, and so I think that was my first experience where feeling like my artistic abilities was very stripped um, mm. and very different. Just so, because of the structure of that. The structure, school, yeah. Right? Yeah, I think, um, and I think a lot of Black people could agree that um, the, the schooling system just isn't built for us. Um, mm. And so I think in the private Catholic high school sector as well, it's also not built. Okay. And it's, it's ironic because the high school that I went to was predominantly POC. Really? Lots of black kids, lots of Latino kids, lots of, lots of us. Um, but we all, we made it through. Not all of us, but most of us, you yeah. know? But I definitely learned through that experience, like more of, I was more aware of my race, more aware of, you know, where I came from, my mm -hmm. background, um, mainly because the high school was also, you know, you have hierarchies. Yes. All the kids are black mm -hmm. and Latino and people of color, but the administrative and the presidency are all white. Wow. So, so you, you didn't, like, at that level, you didn't even see anyone that no, looked like you. No, not really. I think our... Um, my first experience with uh, like black people in my uh, that were like mentors to me in that space was our uh, dean of students. So he did lots of disciplinary. Mm -hmm. So you only really saw him if you were getting in wow. trouble. <laughs> um, and then my favorite teacher of all time was actually Mr. Tyler, and he was a AP English student and that mm -hmm. was our English teacher. And that was my first experience having like a black person that one also believed in me and yeah. two taught me something really really valuable i didn't give two nothings about <laughs> um <laughs> english in school really because i didn't have people to teach me that i was really interested in learning from right so um that was kind of like my first experience i think in high school, high school. Yeah. yeah i mean we can talk at length about the importance of having someone that that looks like you that will inspire you to, mm -hmm. to do things right it's kind of like you know a lot of times we don't even know that we can own our own businesses because we don't grow up yeah. seeing a lot of that, right? Which is mm -hmm. why we're here tonight. Uh, I know as a part of your journey, you ended up going to college in New Mexico. Yes. Right? So you know, you, you love Portland, but you left. Yes, I did leave. <laughs> yeah, I took that uh, opportunity. What, you know, what took you out that way? Like, what was, you were just looking for something different? Like, what was it? Yeah, so I knew I didn't want to um, do anything traditional. I think private Catholic high school, they had you, you be a lawyer, a doctor, something that was very technical. And that just wasn't me. And I've, I've always known that I was an artist at heart. So I remember going to, um, Barbara Ward. She was our, uh, um, like college advisor. And I was like, I don't want to go to a regular school. I don't even want to go to HBCU. I want to go mm. somewhere I can study art. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was like, Oh, there's not very many programs. And so, but I ended up doing my own research and I found Santa Fe University of Art and Design. <laughs> and I was like, this is where I want to go. Yeah. And let me tell you, like, I'd never been to New Mexico, never, ever, ever. And my mom you was like, went. are you sure? Like, <laughs> is that something you really want to do? And we went out there and visited and she was like, I don't know. You, you want to stay? You want to come here? And I was like, yeah, I really do. Yeah. And 
She asked me so many times, like even when she dropped me off, is this, are you sure you want to stay here? She probably wanted you to here? stay. <laughs> she probably wanted you to stay close to home. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but I was so sure of it. Um, and uh, I ended up getting almost a full ride scholarship to go there. Um, I think the only thing that I didn't have covered was my room and board. Wow. Um, which I ended up figuring out for the long term later um, in college. But I went there. The first semester was tough. I wanted to come home. My mom was like, nah, you stay. You stay. You don't stay. <laughs> um, but I'm very glad that I did stay because that it. is, I, I uh, attribute my growing years to that, that mm. place for sure because I would definitely be a completely different person if I hadn't had that experience. Wow. So yeah. you, get the, you go there. You get this different experience in college, and you end up coming back, right? You end up coming mm -hmm. back to Portland. You know, what had, what had changed in that, right? Because you, you, you got this, this experience in art. You, you got, you know, kind of all of this new breath, probably new network, new friends. What was it about, like, why did you want to come back here? You know, I still to this day don't know. I just had a feeling. Mm -hmm. There was a feeling that I was like, okay, this is, I think this is the end of my time here. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I felt like I needed something different. And home was really like the only place where I felt like I could go and thrive or at least have a place to land, yeah. you know, right after having, right at being right after college. Um, I had worked in Santa Fe for about a year after I graduated. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just think it's time to go home. I think it's time to go home. Um, and I, to this day, I know that uh, the reason why I was called to come back home is because my dad was going to pass away. He ended up passing away eight months after I returned home. After you came back. Yeah. So what was what was going on? Like, was it something that had been happening and they didn't tell you for a little while? Or like, it's just you before you knew it, there was a message saying your dad's sick. Yeah. So I, you know, my mom and my dad, they did a lot of like trying to figure out what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. He would go to the doctors and they would get kind of same answers, heartburn, fatigue, things like that. Yeah. drink more fluids, things of that nature. And I think he became frustrated. My, my dad went through a lot with the, just the healthcare in general. His mom um, passed away kind of suddenly, but also because it was miscare, mistreatment. They didn't, you know, take enough of the um, initiative to figure out what was really wrong. Right. And so um, he was also afraid of that as well, just at, for yourself. Like when yeah, you experience that. Yeah, of course, that, if you've seen that happen to someone you care about, exactly. you, you, can't, you don't have much confidence, it's gonna be much better. For you. Exactly, and so that was also his fear. Um, and I think he was frustrated, my mom was frustrated because he didn't want to keep trying. And that was, you know, one of those things that we were all just like, we just don't know what's happening. Um, and, you know, later on, when you learn about what what was going on, you learn about the signs. Mm -hmm. um, when you go through some certain stages of trauma, um, you want to figure out why. How could I have yes. fixed that? Where did I miss the signs? How did you know what was his behavior like? What it like? I went through all of that, wow. you know, for a very long time. Um, but when he passed away, it was very sudden. And I have just faint memories of that weekend that kind of everything just kind of tumbled down. Um, but through the grand scheme of things, really, it was just mistreatment and wow. really not taking the initiative. The heart condition that he had takes one blood test to determine. Ooh. One blood test. And that's after doing tons of research, tons of trying to figure out how this is, how that could have been. That was the research it came down to. It is one simple blood test that could tell you what, that you have cardi cardiomyopathy, which is a, also a very common heart disease mm. in Black or African American men. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a mistreatment. It's a it's a, it's a racial disparity. It's a there's a gap. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of things wrong there. Yeah. But that doesn't just happen. My dad is a victim, but he's not the only. He's not so, the only, right? You know, so you can imagine consistent. how many other people are experiencing that too. Yeah. How did that experience start to impact what would happen with you moving forward, right? Like how did that, like, is that kind of what sent you on this path to start to want to figure out solutions? Mm -hmm. um, if I'm being completely honest, I was very, very angry, but also very inquisitive about what I, what, what happened. Like I said, what did I miss? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I started I went back to school to actually to be a nurse oh, wow. um, because I really just wanted to understand. Yeah. Um, quickly, I figured out that that wasn't for me. I was like, yeah, you know, blood, not really my thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I did other things and tried to figure out, you know, health and wellness has always been a part of my like daily routine. I was vegan for like four and a half years mm -hmm. trying to figure out like really what was 
what worked for my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those are also things that I was in the midst of trying to teach my dad about too, as he was, you know, trying to take care of his health as well, because he was also a very fit person. Like he would go to the gym, like, you know, let's, let's not get it, you know, twisted. He was, he took care, he of, himself, care of himself, you know, to a certain degree. And yeah. I think that, you know, he really did try. Um, so my, my efforts was to try and understand how to prevent, you know, prevent myself. And I think that whole situation, like kind of turned it for my family too. Cause I think my siblings and even my mom are a lot more aware and more conscious, conscious of, of the decisions they make when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I think for me, um, it was, it was really based off anger, but also I wanted to learn more. Um, mm -hmm. and so I also just enjoy, um, teaching people how to uh boost their immune systems like what you know really like that's yeah. like that's what it really boils down to like i love doing that stuff teaching people about things because it's things that we don't especially as black people we don't become privy to until way too late right later, um, right there's you know there's just kind of cultural habits and diets and things that yeah. are, are, are vastly different yes but which is also rooted in yes the, the way that we were brought here mm -hmm. and then how we were fed as you know in slavery like, yeah and it's a, a lot of these things are connected it's a great point because can you imagine telling a 40 something year old man now you have to change the only way you know how to eat yeah like, i can imagine he probably was extremely frustrated you know like yeah. that is it's it doesn't come naturally it takes time it takes a lot of time so learning how to do that from the jump and like teach other people and like be kind of like a pillar in that in that community was something i really wanted to do and so that's just kind of how I'll drink my mate. Yeah, drink. You know? And so did you have any experience before with, you know, because drink my mate is cold pressed juices mm -hmm. and, and, and other health, you know, products. Mm -hmm. Did you have any experience with that before, like coming into the space? And like, how did you even get interested in that? Not necessarily. So I worked at a juice bar in Santa Fe for okay. like two months. <laughs> um, I, I have never worked in the food industry at all. So this is my first attempt at, at it. Like this is. I was like, let's give it a go. I'm going to yeah. learn a whole bunch of new things. Um, but I was doing it myself at home. Like, I love mixology and, the, and I'm not necessarily in the alcohol world, but like, you know, yeah. making mixers and things yeah, like that. That was like it was one a of hobby my favorite of things. It's a hobby. Yeah. yeah. So I love making smoothies and I was always doing stuff on Instagram, like cutting fruit, like just random things I had to do with my, <laughs> my obsession with fruit and beverages and things. Um, and so that's kind of where my experience came, came from. And then obviously you just learn a lot as you go, as it becomes like a profession or something that you do. And so when I got, when there was, the attention was going, mm -hmm. definitely I learned a lot about how to be cleaner, about how to, you know, make it a little bit more fresh, how to, you know, the oxidation of juice, <laughs> like how long it actually lasts. Like just, just all the things that I had no idea I was getting myself into when I started yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> you're like at first it was just a hobby i was enjoying this and then you're like yeah there's all this like learning that starts to come with that process at what point did you start to think maybe other people might want what you were making well um so i started i was making juice videos when the pandemic came came down i was working for a nonprofit. Okay. And I was just making these videos and like putting them out, answering a whole bunch of questions. I was getting a lot of traction at just trying this time with people just trying to learn, right? Right. Because people were at home, so they were probably very That's interested. The only thing they had to do was learn. So, um, <laughs> so I was doing a lot of that, and then I have an art and de design background. So I was like, mm -hmm. let's make it fun. Like, let's do you know a little label. Let's get yeah. some bottles. And I remember my boyfriend. He was like, I was like, oh, should I order like four hundred bottles? Like, am I really gonna like? sell this many because at this point i had been doing this maybe for like two months and mm -hmm. I, I had little mason jars i would get from the grocery store yeah. and things like that i was like should i spend the money on these bottles like what if they don't sell out he's like no do it sell out and i was like are you sure he's like it's gonna sell out i promise i was like i don't know he's like do it do it <laughs> and i did it Wait, um, so you sold out of 400 uh, yeah within a, less than a month and this was just purely like you this posting me, it on Instagram. Yes, this was me doing it myself on Instagram. Like I had a really like basic uh, uh, website that people could streamline their orders through. And yeah. I was just like, let's just try it out. Let's see it. I was super overwhelmed, obviously, <laughs> because I think I remember leaving um, the website open on my birthday. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't think about, oh, maybe I should put a cap on it. Yeah. 
No. Yeah, because you weren't like you weren't sitting there thinking no. like you had previous sales history or any of that data. Absolutely you were just like not. And it was my birthday, so I was getting turned up. <laughs> and then <laughs> the next day I was like, Oh, okay. This is <laughs> this is this is nice. I'm gonna have to spend the next three days juicing, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out all these orders. But I I sold out of those bottles so quickly that I had you know, we had to buy more. And that was that was my like switch, like, oh, okay, I think I can do this. I got a lot of help from my mm. boyfriend, from my mom, from, and then my business partner, Richard, mm-hmm. um, he was like a saving grace in that too, like the financial part and like really helping figure things out. Um, I had lots of friends actually come through and like, Hey, let me help you deliver. Like my cousin Desi came out and helped <laughs> me del- it was a lot. It was, it was a community effort for sure. But, um, that was me doing it out of my home. And then I figured out that was illegal. So <laughs> I had to figure out. <laughs> something else I was, I was gonna ask but i didn't want to yeah. you know i yeah. didn't want to probe it was totally illegal it was totally <laughs> like yeah and we were like oh man like we're gonna be food terrorists like this is ridiculous oh like i can't you know the fda is coming for me um so um we had to make some pivots <laughs> well you know you gotta you gotta try somewhere yeah right? i mean but all if you look at the stats 90 percent of black businesses start at home they start at home. Where else are you going to go and make all this it? investment before you can try things out? That doesn't yeah. make much sense. That doesn't make any sense. Right? And I started at home, so. I mean, yeah. I think it been some right. rules, you know? <laughs> Do some illegal stuff before you get to the real stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't quote me. <laughs> I'd be like, cut that from the tape. <laughs> so, okay, so you. Uh, Drink my maid started to grow really fast, right? And so then you were like, okay, we can't do it here. And so then what? You were like, we're going to go to like a commissary kitchen or mm-hmm. we're going to go to what? How, how are we expanding? Really? So what happened was um, through the grapevine, somehow I got connected with Erica who owns T-Bar. Okay. And at the time she was like, hey, like, let's do collabs come in. Like, you know, you can host pop-ups. Maybe that'll help you. Yada, yada, yada. And I was like, okay. We met and she was like, well, maybe this can be like a stop location. Like maybe you put your juices here, people come pick them up. So maybe you don't have to deliver all the time where you're only different delivered to certain areas. And I was like, that's really actually super helpful. Huh. Um, so that was like the first part of it. But I stopped because then after that, we figured out it was illegal. Because I was still doing it from my you home still at that point. Home. Right. right. So uh, we actually stopped production. And during that time, we're like, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to get a food cart. Are we going to do a commissary kitchen? Like what's the next step? Um, Erica was like, hey. I have this spot, in Northeast Killingsworth. It's not open right now. Let's figure out if that's something that's that you'd want to do, huh. right? And I was like, uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't even had my first pop up yet. Like, I don't even know, you know. You're gonna jump straight yeah, into yeah, a- jump straight into a, a, a brick and mortar. That's crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, just after months of negotiation and lots of help trying to figure out what I should do, um, we opened our first brick and mortar. And signed the lease on September 15th of 2020. Mind you, I started this so March of 2020. We signed the lease September 15th, 2020, and opened October 31st of 2020. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> so, of course, I have to ask <laughs> what all happened after you did that that you didn't expect would happen as a business owner? <laughs> which one <laughs> um <laughs> so we had no money we had like i'm just be frank um we were bootstrapping the entire thing the entire time and i was using a lot of the money that i was making from work to kind of do this uh-huh. um and we got a, a number of grants uh, we got you know two thousand dollars here which we were always so grateful for five thousand here and then we had a um help mom a raise 10k campaign that okay. we we raised over 10k i'll get to that in a second wow. and um we had a tasting event to kind of run some numbers nine days before um we opened i remember richard and i were having a, like a serious conversation he's like he calls me thug he's like okay thug like we really gonna have to like talk about this because on first we have four thousand dollars in bills Ooh. And I'm like, okay, um, that's scary. Okay, we have an opening day. We have a few things. Like, let me see what I can do. Two days after that, I got an email from, um, her name is Olivia, and I'm blanking on her last name right now. Um, but she is um, one of the heads of iPhone Women. And she reached out. She's like, hey, like, I saw your business on iPhone Women. I would love to get you into this to this uh, 
to this group to kind of talk about your business and things like that. And mind you, I thought it was a panel. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, like, yeah, I'll talk about I'll my talk business. About it, like, yeah. this, is, this is great. I think this is good exposure. Like, it's not money, but whatever. <laughs> um, and I go into this meeting and I remember I was in the shop that we just signed the lease for. I'm sitting there with my computer. One of my best friends, Michaela, is there. My mom is there. And I have this meeting and they're like, hey, like, we love what you're doing. They had me explain what I was doing first. Yeah. And they're like, we love what you're doing. We would love to award you $25,000 for your business. And I was like, Can I meet them? Right. Okay. I was like, "Uh, okay. I was like, yeah. I was super shocked. And they were like, of course. Does that sound great? I was like, yeah, yeah. It does sound, (laughs) it sounds great. Um, I had lots of tears afterwards. Um, and that experience was crazy because I think we did a lot of pushing this out based off faith, had mm. no idea where this was, where was going to come going? from. Right. We just knew it was going to happen. Um, so that, that 25,000 was like almost like our first loan. And mind you, I mean, we, we, we still have yet to take out a loan for our business. Um, Ooh. so <laughs> yeah, um, and so wow. that was a very big point for me where I was like, this is where I'm meant to be. Like, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is like, I'm here for a reason. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was, that was so helpful because, you know, we had a great opening. We had a yep. little bit more of a, <sighs> like we can breathe. <laughs> like I, I might be able to sleep tonight finally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of community effort. But that grant, that's that really grant what set it off. In. And it was the American Express, a hundred by one hundred. They awarded a hundred women, a hundred black women, grants of twenty five thousand wow. dollars. And I was one of them. And I didn't apply. I had no idea about it. They picked me based they off of my me. iPhone Women campaign. Yeah. Mind you, also, I remember my mom and I were going back and forth between doing Indiegogo or. <laughs> Uh, iPhone women, and we were like, let's do iPhone women. It seems like a little bit more creative. Wow. What are the chances? Shout yeah. out to mom. Shout out to mom. Uh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and uh, I wanted us to kind of talk about a little bit, is you talked about the faith part. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's a critical part to talk about as entrepreneurs. Because a lot of times, right, we can, we got a vision for where we might want to go. We mm-hmm. got plans for where we might want to go. But I find when I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs, there's still a lot of ambiguity. Right. And there comes a point where you kind of got to get comfortable with it. Yeah. Is that kind of like, would you find that to be like accurate? Like, is that your experience? And like, it's a part of this. Yeah. I mean, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's really what it is. <laughs> because I think the entire time I was uncomfortable. I, I, and if I'm being completely honest, like I would go to bed with anxiety. I'd wake up with anxiety. Don't know what's going to happen today. Something really shitty happened yesterday. And it might also happen today. But I think also, working through those hurdles really takes you to the next step. A lot of people stop at certain hurdles and really you don't know on the other side of that hurdle, if that could really be your breakthrough. Mm. And so I think a lot of it had to do with faith. And I think a lot of it had to do with um, God and the forces above me and my ancestors really pushing me through because truly it's not, it's, it was bigger than me at that point. And I knew that. And I still know that today that it's bigger than me. And I always tell people like drink mame is, is me, but it's not about me. It's about the Mm. community. I've given it away. It's the communities. It's, you know, a gift from my ancestors. That's kind of how I think of it because it's really, you know, in order to do something like this, you really have to be into it and you really have to want it because this is not like, I wake up sometimes. I'm like, this is, this is ghetto. This is, (laughs) this is. This is ghetto. And I, I, you know, I, I want to, there's days where I want to quit. There's days where I like lay in bed, can't get out of bed, but there, but there's still something to look forward to because you still have to have that faith. There's still, you know, there's, and it's also, it's also important to know like who's watching you, Mm. but also who believes in you Yes, because I'm like, if I quit, I'm letting every single person down that believes in me right now. It's a, it's a whole different thing, especially the way you speak about it, right? You, Mm -hmm. you, you, you've already understood that it's not about you yeah. right it, it, it is bigger than you there's mm-hmm. a a thing that you represent right mm-hmm. and there's there's people of all generations that are like yeah i love that that you're doing this and so it, it, it's great to kind of hear that perspective and how you understand and deal with the weight yeah of, of that um as 
as this time has gone, you also mentioned that you hadn't take out, taken out any loans since then. So what does that mean on the business side? Has the business just been growing so rapid yeah. that you are able to operate from the business? Yeah. I think um, it's a it's a blessing that I haven't had to put my own personal finances into my business. I think that that is such an underrated blessing that I have been blessed with. <laughs> um, I, you know, we did a lot of fundraising and, um, you know, we raised about, I think at, even after the $25,000, we raised about $67,000 and that brought us to a $200,000 business at the end of 2021. Ooh. Um, and wow. that's based off mainly sales. I mean, we did really no huge marketing initiatives. We were super creative. Like when I want to do something creative, like it was my family, my friends really coming together to make it happen. Like my boyfriend does a lot of videography, so he would do stuff for me. My, my cousins were involved in like drinking juice for me <laughs> and trying on clothes and like things like that. Like, you know, we didn't put a whole bunch of money into marketing. We put all of the money that we had back into the business, right. making it work. And then also... Um, hiring help because at a certain point you do need help. And for the first year, it was me and Richard and um, bless her heart, Michaela, my one of my best friends. She <laughs> stayed for an entire year. And that was that she was wrote it out. She wrote it out. You know, I, I owe my entire life to Michaela um, and um, really just pumped it out. I, I, I think we are so blessed to not have to have done that. And yeah. I think also as a new business, too you don't get a lot of opportunities to take out loans. So there really wasn't an option, you know? Wow. You can finance things. You can finance your fridge. Like, I remember the first financial finance thing we did was, fi was like, get some fridges because we you need to put you the juice it. in the fridge, right? right? right. Um, but we didn't have the money, so we we took a really shitty finance deal. Mm -hmm. um, but we learned from that. Yeah. And But that was really, at that time, like, the only thing we had financed besides, like, our juicer and mm -hmm. things like that. But everything else... Based off sales, baby, proof is in the pudding. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've experienced growth in a, in a short amount of time, but clearly you also understand what it means and, and kind of this vision that you have for it. Can you share with us a little bit about, like, where do you see Drink Mame going? Like, what's your vision for it? Because it sounds like it's bigger than juice. Yeah. It's bigger than juice. I, you know, and I think we talked about it briefly upstairs, but I would really love to um, impact. I think Portland Public Schools is like my first, like something I really want to tackle, like my first um, like mission based, mm -hmm. you know, goal is to tackle the the health and wellness within kids because that's where it starts. If, right. you, if you really want to go back and that's where it starts learning our eating habits mm -hmm. is, you know, at, from our adolescence. So I think I really would love to start there and one, get healthier options into schools, um, food, beverage, because I, I was flabbergasted. I went into one of these schools and they had a vending machine. I did not have a vending machine when I, I went to school younger. <laughs> I, there was no such thing as a vending machine, but there's like soda and candy and like juices and like that are, you know, high in sugar and yep. lots of, you know, so that's like my first thing. But I think additionally, to that, I would love to just be more direct to consumer. I think a lot of businesses aim their businesses to be um, ap to appeal to other businesses mm. that could sell their product. Oh, like but so I, wholesale to grocers. Yes, or, yes. Okay. But I'm way more interested in building a solid customer base and delivering directly to that customer, mm. um, specifically the black customer. Yeah, you know. In that and, though, there's also a business aspect too, right? Like there's. Mm -hmm there's more margin so yeah. that because when you go wholesale you're splitting that up with, yeah, with someone exactly. else right yeah. and i don't um we're a hundred percent black owned company and i would love to stay that way and um i think that i would love to just not use that middleman too much i have a i have a lot of strong opinions you know and <laughs> hey <you> know, <laughs> nothing wrong with them strong opinions you keep I've, sharing them you know <laughs> you i have know? strong opinions about you know where where and how the black dollar is circulated yeah. right yeah. and i think that that comes from even though you know i don't I don't we I'm, I don't have anywhere at the end of the day to get 
this financing from, but I know staying true to myself and my goals and really where I see this going in the next five to 10, that's what's going to push me along. It isn't necessary. It's not a race. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. And um, so sticking true to the values is really what's most important to me and making sure that I'm doing right, not just for me, but for the community as well, because, you know, when you sell or when you have other people or other white counterparts to consult, your vision gets lost in the sauce. Mm. And so it's, and it's very, very easy for that to happen and you lose yourself. I don't want to do that. There's a, you know, there's a lot of things that we've been able to do just off being creative. And a couple of days ago, this happened twice this week. Someone was like, you're very resourceful. And I, I like, that is, that's it. Like, that's it. <laughs> that's me. Like I'm super resourceful. Like if I need something, I'm going to find it and I'm going to do it and I'm going to go for it. Um, but there's also the other side of me that's just super lazy, wants to lay back, wants to go, you know, chill on the beach, wrong with right? So like trying to find that balance, right? right. Um, but I think overall just really honing in on that being resourceful we can do it we don't have to have this huge super huge budget to do anything but as long as we're touching people reaching to people people are feeling us we're feeling them we're being genuine and authentic and loving and open that's really what it's all about that's that's just me Cindy thank you so much like this is it was truly a really inspiring conversation and just it also being able to witness what, what you're being able to do and grow, right? Like, I, I just learned a, a ton from you. Um, and I'm going to message you about all these things later. <laughs> um, but but thank you so much for, for, for sharing with us tonight. Y'all give Sydney another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.